Again, thank you for being here on this Thursday night. Uh, I appreciate it. And tonight the Koch Center is launching something brand new. What we're launching is a new lecture series called the Governance, Law, and Economics Lecture Series. This lecture series is designed to highlight the three institutions that have to work together to support and defend a free civil society. Those institutions are, of course, good governance, the rule of law, and market-based institutions. It's in that environment where those three things overlap that human beings are able to use their creativity, their diversity, their skills to create value for people in their community, or as ESU, as we refer to it as, creating for the common good. And it's up to us to understand what those institutions are and how they directly affect our ability to have flourishing. Tonight, our inaugural speaker is Dr. David Beta. He is a research fellow at the Independent Institute and a professor of history at the University of Alabama. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin and he is a recipient of the Ellis Hawley Prize. Dr. Beto is the author of many books, two of which are Mutual Aid to the Welfare State, Fraternal Societies and Social Services, 1890 to 1967, and his forthcoming book, which is, he, which is what he's here to talk to us tonight about, is T.R.M. Howard, Doctor, Entrepreneur, and Civil Rights Pioneer, that he wrote with his wife, Linda Royster Beto. He's a former president of the Alabama Scholars Association, and the chair of the Alabama State Advisory Committee of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He's also the founder of the Liberty and Power blog at the History News Network. As an urban and social historian, Dr. Beto is published in many journals, some of which include the Journal of Southern History, the Journal of Policy History, the Journal of Interdisciplinary History, Journal of Urban History, the Independent Review, the Nevada Historical Society Quarterly, and other scholarly publications. But he's also written for the popular press, and his popular writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Times, Perspectives, History News Network, the National Review, and Reason, and other outlets. Tonight's program will be a 15-minute presentation by Dr. Beto with a 10-minute open forum Q&A session. And then following that, we'll have an open reception in the lobby behind the second floor exit. So without any further ado, please join me in providing a very warm ESU welcome to Dr. David Beto. Thank you, Derek. I spoke at an event that Derek was at about, I guess you were a student at that time, or were you a faculty member? About 10 years ago? I co-sponsored it. Oh, you co-sponsored it. All right. Well, 10 years ago, I can't remember. But anyway, I did well enough there that he invited me back, and not only that, you made me the inaugural speaker. So this is a, this is a heavy burden that I'm going to have to bear. I'll do my best. Uh, why don't I start with some questions? How many people here have heard of Medgar Evers? There's a few here. Uh, Medgar Evers was a civil rights leader in Mississippi. He, uh, he was assassinated in 1963 in a very controversial trial where the killer was let off and then was retried. And uh, his wife uh, gave the benediction at uh, President Obama's uh, 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 inaugural speech. Uh, how many people here have heard of Fannie Lou Hamer? Oh, nobody? No one's heard of Fannie Lou Hamer? Well, Fannie Lou Hamer was another very important figure in the civil rights movement. We're talking about people here that would be in the top five of civil rights figures in the 20th century, probably. And Hamer, I think, would probably be there. And she was from Mississippi uh, and was very well known in 1964 for trying to get a delegation of, of, of uh, African Americans seated as, as part of the Mississippi delegation and uh, uh, had a big run-in with President Johnson. Finally was able to get them, you know, get them on. But, you know, was famous for making the statement, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Again, she was very much a, an organizer um, in that respect. 
And then the third figure, I got to got to believe most some people remember her, Rosa Parks. Everybody knows about Rosa Parks, right? I would think. Um, well, we probably would not have heard of any of those figures. I will go on the limb, or let's put it this way, very good chance we would not have heard of any of those figures without Dr. T.R.M. Howard, who was the subject of a book, a book that my wife and I co-authored that's going to come out in May. And um, so let me go forward here and let's see, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm trying to go to the next one, it went down. I need help here. There we go. I got it. I got it. I figured it out, finally. I'm not used to one of these. I usually just, in my lectures, I just run up to the computer and, and do that. Okay. Well, the story of Dr. Howard is not just the story of a single man. It's also a testament, really, to the role of the black middle class uh, during the 20th century. Business, professional people who formed self-help organizations, uh, business organizations, mutual aid organizations, and who also were instrumental in fighting segregation and were really pioneers in the civil rights movement and helped to fund its development. And Howard is a key guy here in, in, in that profile. Uh, at the time, in the 1950s, he looms large in a black newspaper such as the Chicago Defender, the leading black newspaper in the U.S., the Pittsburgh Courier, the Memphis World. He is heading out headline news all over the all over the place. He four years before the Montgomery bus boycott, which was in 1955, he has his own successful mass boycott in Mississippi. He ran civil rights rallies in the early 50s in Mississippi that, that typically would attract, you know, middle rural Mississippi, 10,000 people or more. He faced down publicly a segregationist governor. Um, in Mississippi, if you're looking at the history of Jim Crow and racial white supremacy, was the belly of the beast in the 1950s. It was where those institutions of racism were, there, were at their strongest. He, he made scathing criticism of the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, which you did not do very often in the 1950s. Hoover was regarded as a hero. He also threw himself into the Emmett Till case. And I'll assume some people may have even heard of T Emmett Till, but Emmett Till was a 14-year-old from Chicago who came to Mississippi in 1955 to visit his, his great uncle. Uh, he came there every summer. In any case, he went into a store and was accused of uh, uh, giving a wolf whistle, all sorts of different accounts, of whistling at a white woman in the store, which is something you don't do if you're black at that time in rural Mississippi. Anyway, the uh, uh, husband of the, uh, of the woman in the store went with his brother, their names are Milam and Bryant, and they killed Emmett Till, dumped his body in the river, and the body was later found, and it became a major issue. Anyway, Howard was instrumental in trying to find the truth in that case. You have people like uh, Martin Luther, uh, well, here, here's a sort of a start here with an illustration of his importance. This is 1955, notice King is not yet prominent enough to even be on the roll. This is the annual honor roll published by the Chicago Defender, the leading black newspaper in the United States. And look, there we have Dr. T.R.M. Howard, number one for arousing the nation to the criminal conspiracy of white supremacists in the state of Mississippi. Um, so, um, he was a key guy uh, at this time. He got a lot of attention. A little bit about his background. Dr. Howard, unlike a lot of civil rights leaders like King and, oh, I don't know, Thurgood Marshall and, and some of the others, he was born in poverty. His parents were tobacco twisters. He was born 1908 in Murray, Kentucky. His original name was Theodore Roosevelt Howard. Theodore Roosevelt was president, of course, at that time. Uh, Howard ends up having a lot in common with Theodore Roosevelt, including the 
big, his, his role is a big game hunter. It's maybe one of the reasons people don't want to read about him now. I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about that. His parents divorced. His father was abusive. His parents divorced when he was a child. Um, his mother had gotten a menial job as a cook for a local white doctor who ran the local hospital. And the doctor's name was William Mason. This is the hospital. Mason was very important in Howard's life. He noticed this was a smart kid. Um, and Howard told him at one point that he wanted to be a doctor, which was just sort of unheard of for you know, somebody in that economic level. Um, and Mason encouraged him and helped open doors for him to get into Seventh-day Adventist schools. Mason was a Seventh, Seventh-day Adventist. And Howard was so grateful for this that he uh, took as one of his middle names Mason. So it was Theodore Roosevelt, Mason Howard. And he ended up going to Oakwood University in Alabama, and then Union College in Nebraska, and then finally medical school at Loma Linda University, all Seventh-day Adventist institutions. At the latter two, he was the only black student at those institutions, which of course helped shape him. The first place he went, like I said, was Union College, where he faced segregation. He faced very much unequal treatment. He didn't know where to sit when he went into the dining room as the only black student. And he was very careful not to make trouble, so he would just sit by himself, and occasionally white students would come and sit by him. So that's a really difficult situation to be the only person there and yet face segregation. But he had some friendships and, and good relationships there as well. And he always stood out wherever he was. And here's an early example of a young Howard, what is he, 22 at this time, enters a contest, a ration, uh, oratorical uh, contest uh, um, on, a, on, a, on an issue of prohibition, defending prohibition. He didn't stay with this position. But he gave an oration defending prohibition to a nearly all white crowd. And according to an eyewitness account, the entire audience rose in a great demonstration which lasted several minutes. And he won the prize for best order. This is for a group called the uh, American anti Saloon League, which was the main sort of prohibitionist group in the country. So he was a very talented, uh, had a gift for gab, as people have said about Dr. Howard, definitely. And we're going to hear some of that later on. Please, please. Right. There he is with his mother in uh, uh, Murray, Kentucky. That's about 1931. Now, Howard ends up going to California because it's really the only place he could go. Well, there aren't many places for, you know, uh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, but the Seventh-day Adventists were segregated in most of the country, but they, but they're, 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 some of their schools had a degree of integration, and one of them was at the time called the College of Medical Evangelists, now called Loma Linda University, which is quite known for many health innovations. And he graduated from that school in 1935, and before he graduated, he met, and then he would eventually marry this woman, uh, Helen Boyd Howard. She uh, came from a wealthy black family, relatively wealthy, in Riverside, California. And she was tied in in a big way with the black elite. And there's very much a black elite, clubs and so forth. She was tied into that. She introduced him uh, into that world. But at the same time, Howard was very comfortable around that elite, but he was very comfortable around ordinary people, too. He would make you the center of attention if you were the janitor in the room, right? He'd ask all about you. He, he never lost that common touch. Um, her brother, by the way, was one of the first black executives at Pepsi-Cola, and there's even a book written about him. Um, who I, I interviewed him many times for this book, and he was very helpful. Well, Howard works a couple different places, but then he gets an offer to go to uh, Mississippi, and uh, to uh, a town in Mississippi called Mound Bayou, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, to become uh, a chief surgeon at this hospital. It is called the Taborian Hospital. Uh, it is founded in um, 1942. 
And it's probably worthwhile to talk a little bit about the sponsoring group, because these groups of any of you taking history courses, you don't hear a lot about them. Yours truly has written about them. Fraternal organizations. Groups like the Elks and the Odd Fellows and the Masons. Before the rise of the welfare state, these groups in many cases were mutual insurance organizations that provided social welfare for people. And uh, this well, there was a group in Mississippi, well, actually nationally, called the Knights International Order of Twelve Knights and Daughters of Tabor, which originally came out of a group that had planned a slave rebellion. They called it off at the last minute before the Civil War, but then they reformed as a fraternal group, and they had both men and women in it, so it's called fraternal. Actually, this group had predominantly female membership, and uh, they built this hospital. Uh, to uh, provide for the members. And again, it looks a lot like a lot of other typical fraternal organizations. And it pledged to advance morality, uh, self-government, self-reliance, kinds of values that you could find in white, immigrant, or black fraternal societies. And I would fault my colleagues in the history of profession for somehow, sometimes getting so fixated on differences between groups that they don't look at this sort of common American heritage of mutual aid. Um, and, and, and we certainly see that in fraternal societies. Okay, Knights and Daughters of Tabor, or the Taborian Hospital, do I have that picture there? I shouldn't have had that there, but I'll go back. Was located right uh, up there, well, I can't really point to it, it doesn't really matter, towards the middle there. Uh, on the left side is the town of Mount Bayou, which is a very interesting history. It's an all-black town in Mississippi, still pretty much is. It was founded in the late 19th century by a ex-slave of Jefferson Davis's brother, who was something of a kind of philanthropist type. And they founded this town, and it was self-governing. It had black mayors. At the time, Mississippi, in the early 20th century, had taken the vote away from the vast majority of the black population. But Mount Bayou was an exception. It had a black mayor, city council, police chief. It was its own little haven. And it was the perfect place for a hospital like this because you didn't have to worry about curfew. A lot of Mississippi towns had curfew. If you were black out a certain, after a certain time, you were in trouble, right? It's the closest thing we've gotten to a totalitarian society if you were a black person living in Mississippi at this time. But anyway, this is a place, you know, where you have safety, you have stability. Um, and uh, he is, um, uh, uh, comes to this small town. Um, uh, now, um, the, co the hospital has a real fascinating uh, trajectory. It doesn't just serve people in this town, it serves people in the whole Mississippi Delta, that's the Delta region, where most African Americans lived. Uh, it is, uh, the cost of construction had been about $100,000. It had two major operating rooms. It had an x-ray room, sterilizer, incubators, electrocardiograph. It had a blood bank. It had a laboratory. It had uh, two or three doctors on staff, all black, of course. And you paid, if you were a member for these services, $8.40 a year. That would be about $100 now. And you get 30 days of hospital, hospital care uh, at the Taborian Hospital. Um, and the hospital had, of course, heavy use uh, uh, from all over the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and here you have a picture from the Saturday Evening Post of patients waiting to see doctors at the Taborian Hospital. And uh, as a result of the hospital, the membership of this group just in Mississippi grew to 50,000 members. All black, mostly women, as I said, also not a dime of government aid. Even though if you were to look at the profile of your typical member, your typical member is under the poverty line. I mean, almost ridiculously under, right? Poverty lines, you know, almost meaningless to talk about during this period, but they definitely would be in it. Uh, farm laborers, sharecroppers, that kind of thing. He was a very busy doctor there, uh, performed maybe 12 operations a day sometimes, 
delivered a lot of babies. He splits off in 1948, because uh, Howard would, you know, Howard is the, there is a picture of him examining a patient. He splits off because Howard's the kind of guy, he's going to go off on his own, right? He's going to be in charge. And he splits off in 1948 and he forms his own hospital, his own, whoops, home fraternal, how do I get that back on? I banged the table, that's, there we go. He uh, 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 starts his own fraternal group called the United Order of Friendship and they build a hospital across the street. So for the next 20 years you have two competing uh, fraternal hospitals, very similar, um, uh, right across the street from each other in a very similar structure. These are, uh, these, these, these enterprises are springboards for Howard to go into all sorts of enterprises, businesses. Um, he builds the first swimming pool for blacks in the state of Mississippi. Not just a, you know, just a little puddle, a really Olympic sized pool. He builds, uh, he, he has a 1600 acre cotton and cattle plantation. He has a restaurant with a, uh, a, uh, a beer garden. There he is on one of his farms. Um, he, uh, there you get a sense of the Howard family. Um, I say made, but I heard that this actually wasn't a maid. It was a woman who sort of came in. It's dressed in a maid like uniform. But, but this is Howard, inter the Howards entertaining the other black doctor and his wife there. Uh, there's the zoo. He also had a zoo that he set up that had uh, monkeys in it, uh, peacocks, rabbit, rabbits, <laughs> alligators, parrots, uh, had an aquarium around it. He made Mound Bayou a kind of community center. He was a promoter. I would call him the, uh, uh, in many ways, the P.T. Barnum of civil rights. He knew how to put on a good show. He was not afraid to display his wealth. He had expensive cars. He'd be riding those suckers all around. He'd change his suit several times a day. He'd go to the racetrack and gamble. He, he, was, he lived high. He, he was a lived in the fast lane. And that's not your typical stereotype of a civil rights leader, I suppose. Uh, he also, this is not the best picture here, but formed, uh, started an insurance company and it's called the Magnolia. And why do I talk about that? Well, it's, there are many businesses he did. One reason is he hired out of, out of uh, uh, a school, uh, just graduated. Uh, yeah, there they are. Medgar Murley, or he hired, they actually hired both of them. He hired Medgar Evers to sell insurance for him. And Medgar Evers apparently was quite a good insurance salesman, so I'm told. Um, and but Howard said, "Hey, if you you know if you ever sort of wanted to talk civil rights, he said, well, when you go out and collect your premiums, you want to talk up civil rights, go to it." And he did. And so Evers was very involved in Howard's civil rights activities. Merle Evers still with us. Uh, she worked for Dr. Howard. He delivered her first two uh, children. Um, now, in 1951, Howard decided to become more of a explicitly involved in civil rights. He'd always been interested in those issues, and he formed the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. And there's the board members of the Regional Council. This is a group, Howard was very much influenced by Booker T. Washington, a big advocate of self-help and business and so forth. He was a Washingtonian. But also in his strategy, you could say there's elements here of another black leader named W.E.B. Du Bois, who said that you rely, you use elites kind of to lead. And this is a group of elites, but they're the leading black leaders, leading black leaders in the state of Mississippi, the college presidents, the heads of the agricultural organizations, the heads of the business groups, the heads of the fraternal groups, they all are there. And they are pro to provide leadership uh, for the masses, bringing together the leaders of the masses. Very interesting strategy. Uh, so if you try to find out how many members of the regional council have, probably not that many because it mainly would operate through these constituent organizations. That was the whole point of it, um, basically. All right, 
Now, one of the first things that the regional council does, and Medgar Evers is very involved in this as well, is they start a campaign called Don't Buy Gas Where You Can't Use the Restroom, and they distribute something like 10,000 of those bumper stickers. In Mississippi, if you were black and went to a public restroom, well, public restroom, went to a restroom at a gas station, is what the main focus was here, what they would say to you is, sorry, we don't have a colored restroom. Now, they might sometimes have a, quote, colored restroom. They would never let you use the restroom. Whites use, of course. And so this campaign is, we're going to boycott these service stations. And lo and behold, they are successful. What happens, I think, a lot of it is the big chains get involved and put pressures on their local stations. And they install colored restrooms which may not seem like much of a victory, but in the context of Mississippi it is. And one shouldn't forget that the initial demand of the Montgomery bus boycotters was not integration, but true, separate, but equal, because it was just even then considered too dangerous, perhaps. But they were successful in this campaign of using economic pressure. Surprisingly, I don't see much evidence of violence or anything used against them. Um, perhaps because they weren't challenging integration directly, but it was still a pretty radical move. Now, Howard, and these pictures aren't the best here. I have other ones, but I didn't get them there. Uh, you, can go, you can go to the TRM Howard Facebook site and see some good ones. So if you want to know more about it, see some good photos. Uh, Howard, like I said, would typically attract would do these annual rallies for the Regional Council of Negro Leadership where they would have a big name speaker, big name entertainment, and they would draw like 10,000 people. Mount Bayou maybe had 900 people living there. So they would draw all these people in from all over the place. It was a big event. They would take over Highway 61, a portion of the famous Highway 61, and invite all the local black high schools, black colleges, their bands, they'd have a big parade and it would be made into these festivities. And they would have speakers like uh, Thurgood Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice, Charles Diggs, only black member of Congress, and entertainers like uh, Mahalia Jackson. I don't know if any of you saw, uh, what was that one called? Selma, isn't that what it was called? Just Selma? Anybody see that? Anyway, they had Mahalia Jackson in there, very famous gospel singer. So uh, class A entertainment. And there she is with Dr. Howard. And in the back, uh, or in the front, actually, is Congressman. That's another congressman he had. He had two congressmen. William Dawson, congressman from Illinois. First time a, uh, a black congressman had gone to the South, apparently, and given speeches and that kind of thing in like 50 years. All right. Well, there we see Howard in a very uncomfortable, you can't really see him, but a somewhat uncomfortable looking Thurgood Marshall riding the parade car down the main street here in Mount Bayou. And we see uh, you know, a description here, the parade car to watch prancing ma majorettes from Tennessee State University. Majorettes in Tennessee State U ba uh, uh, band led parade through town of Mount Bayou. And then they would go to a big circus tent because there was nowhere you could have 10,000 people in Mount Bayou and so forth. Uh, okay, now, Howard is faced with a real situation here where he's got to put up or shut up when in 1954 we get the Supreme Court decision and that decision um, is Brown versus Board and the court ruled against separate but equal for schooling. It was a little vague on how to integrate but basically saying we want desegregation. Um, and Howard and the NAACP teamed up to try to make Mississippi the first place to integrate. They failed. But if it had been, their argument was if we knock Mississippi out, we knock out the whole system. And that's what they were trying to do. And um, the governor of Mississippi called a meeting of leading blacks in the state. This is after the decision. And he proposed and says, look, I'll give you equal. We'll do a crash campaign to spend money on black schools. Just agree to this and agree to give up on this integration thing. He called these people together, expecting them to go along. And with Howard's influence, this whole group said, no, governor, we're not going along. 
with this. And supposedly, the governor said to Howard, now look here, you know and I know that if we ask all the Negroes in the state how they felt about integration, 90% would be opposed to it. Don't you believe that? And Howard is supposed to have said, Governor, if I told you that 90% of the blacks in Mississippi did not want to go to heaven, would you believe that? Here you got worst place in the country for Jim Crow, you know, this guy telling off the governor. And uh, there were very negative headlines about this. Uh, black surgeon calls governor liar was, uh, was one of them. So uh, this is a serious matter here because you're getting the rise of these white racist movements now trying to push for our resistance to the Brown decision. Um, let's go back. And um, um, to give you a sample of how bad things are getting, Ebony Magazine had an article in 1955 that, that reported that the, there was a Klan death list which included Howard and nine other people. Um, so he is very much uh, in the targets. He hires bodyguards to protect himself and his family. Whenever he left Mount Bayou, he would tend to go in groups. Now, this is a very interesting, um, well, let's go back here, talk a little bit about that. Very briefly, let's talk about this before we go on with that issue. One of the things that a group that called the Citizens Council, the White Citizens Councils, tried to do to fight the Brown decision was to cloak, was to shut down the civil rights movement by denying blacks who were involved in it loans and credit. And they were tied in with the local banks and so forth. So they put pressure, it was called a credit freeze. And in reaction to this, Howard had a plan. He went to the NAACP, they agreed to it. Howard was on the board of directors of one of the leading black banks in the country in Memphis, and he proposed that black business organizations, social organizations, deposit, ship their deposits over to Tri-State. Tri-State would use that as a basis to give loans to people who were victims of the credit squeeze, credit, credit freeze. So here we have uh, the anti-freeze boys, and of course Howard, this is his idea, and it was, it was somewhat successful. I think it relieved the pressure. So if you were under pressure, you didn't have to go to your local bank now, you could go to Tri-State, and they would give you a loan, if, assuming you met you know, standards. Now, as I said, there's a lot of violence, a lot of threats of violence, and um, Howard, had to defend himself. And he runs afoul of gun control laws. Other than gun control, you don't associate gun control with the South. You don't associate gun, gun control with the state of Mississippi. But that is where the first significant gun controls came in. Under slavery and the black code, under the slave codes, then under the slave codes. And then later, you had laws in the South trying to ban various kinds of weapons uh, that were cheap weapons that blacks could afford. And uh, um, uh, if you were a black person, you wanted to get a permit to carry a gun, handgun in your car, forget it. The white county sheriffs would not give you such a permit. And so Howard uh, always had a handgun with him. He was heavily armed. He had a Thompson submachine gun, which he would show off. Um, and which was illegal, of course, probably. Well, I guess you can get them. He might have gotten the license. Uh, but he he had a, um, a handgun stowed in a secret hiding place in his car. So whenever the police pulled him over, he would put it in there. And I have real examples of where he his car is pulled over, his bodyguards are arrested, and each have to pay a hundred dollars for carrying a concealed weapon. So it's a lot of money in the mid. 50s and said no weapon was on Dr. Howard. And these guys at these rallies were heavily armed. And Howard wasn't afraid to show it. This is Howard serving food, his own signature uh, recipe, at one of these annual rallies. And he makes sure that everyone can see he's got a rifle there ready to go. 
And one of the reasons why you have very little violence against these rallies, you would think you'd have whites taking pot shots, they can't get close in enough because they know people will fire back. And so you have a very active black gun culture and Howard very much connects his civil rights activism to the right of armed self-defense. Okay, all right, Howard is very much involved in the case I mentioned before, the Emmett Till case. Remember, his body is dumped in the Tallahatchie River. It is found pretty much by mistake, heavily disfigured. That picture appears on the cover of Jet. It appears in black newspapers. It is horrific. And it leads to a lot of anger. And a lot of teenagers during that time, including a young Muhammad Ali, were very, very much energized and influenced by this, right? How Emmett Till's mother is Mamie Till Mobley. She comes, what happens is two white brothers did this. They were arrested, which was a surprise. And they were put on trial in the small town, uh, a small town of Sumner, Mississippi. And Emmett Till's mother came to testify. Howard uh, gave her refuge. She stayed with them. Uh, it, when she was in Mississippi, he provided an armed escort to the trial, as well as the other witnesses. He spent uh, a whole evening, there was, the trial was very short, and they were on a tight schedule, but he spent a whole evening looking around for evidence uh, in cooperation with local whites who were willing to actually try to find out who did it. So there were all these midnight searches for possible witnesses. It was all for naught, however, because these two white brothers in a trial and a jury in less than an hour got together and agreed that they were, that they, they acquitted them. So the trial took, was less than about a month, less than a month after the murder. That's how fast it was. They were acquitted and Howard had seen it coming. He said, I don't think they'll ever get convicted. It's not going to happen. And it didn't happen. But he made, a, he made an effort. But it did energize the civil rights movement. And here we have more pictures. There's Howard with Emma Till's mother standing right next to her. That's Congressman Diggs, who was at the trial. Uh, this is some of the political publicity we get. This is from the Chicago Defender. Howard is in the lead, followed by Roy Wilkins, head of the NAACP, coming to uh, try to bring justice after several lynchings, including the lynching of Emmett Till, had occurred in rapid succession. Uh, the NAACP helped to fund a speaking tour for principals in the case, including Howard. So we went to cities like Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, and gave many, many speeches on this issue and would draw big crowds. So this is after the acquittal. But people were so outraged and hoped maybe there'd be another trial or maybe other witnesses would be found um, that it galvanized people. And really, this is, this, uh, these, these rallies were very important. And one of the lesser known places that he went was Montgomery, Alabama. And he went there uh, uh, the November, 27th, 1955, his host was an unknown minister named, locally he was known, but not nationally, Martin Luther King Jr. And Rosa Parks was in the audience. And his speech was on, dealt with a number of issues, including Emmett Till. And she said later that that was the first big event that, that she ever attended about the Till case. And she also said later that three days after Howard gave this speech, she refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus. And she said later that she was thinking of Emmett Till. So I can't say 100%, but Howard certainly plays a role in enabling people like this. Because Parks was doing this as a spur of the moment thing. Yeah, she was involved in civil rights activities. but. She acted, and she said later she was thinking of Emmett Till. And this is from one of the local, local black papers. He proposed a march on Washington. That didn't really happen. Million Man March, which did later happen, but, but not during this period. Um, Howard was very critical of the FBI. 
Um, he said, for some reason, the FBI, it's very strange that they can find out who blew up a plane by looking at the wreckage, but they can't seem to find out who kills a black person. Uh, and Hoover, the FBI director, wrote an open letter criticizing Howard for that speech. We'll finish up. Uh, Howard left Mississippi December 1955. There were threats on the family. His wife was slapped by a policeman. Uh, she wanted out. In fact, she had a number of health problems. No, it's unclear why it left, but I think that that had a role. He might have sought in seeking bigger horizons. And what he, all, he does two years after he leaves is he runs for Congress as a Republican against the Democratic black congressman who he previously had hosted in Mississippi, Dawson. Uh, President Eisenhower comes in to campaign for Dr. Howard, um, but he loses big time. However, his political campaign helped to spur an independent anti-machine movement and, some, and, and, and played a role in helping to lead to the later victory of his friend, Harold Washington, for mayor, indirectly at least. He spoke at the funeral of Medgar Evers in 1963. He gave the main, main eulogy. Um, and he, in Chicago, he was known for his, uh, for being a, a big game hunter. And he boasted that he was the leading black, uh, American black, uh, game hunter, big game hunter in the, in the world, and who am I to disagree? And he had a room in his house called the Safari Room, where he had all of his stuffed animals. Very politically on PC guy. But at the time, this was, he regarded this as very much an accomplishment. Emmett Till's mother, who I interviewed, said that she used to teach school. She would bring them in there, and people would occasionally comment on, why are you killing all these animals? And he's like, well. I grew up doing this in Kentucky. He, he was the guy, his hunting paid for, basically kept the family going. And his mother gave him, I think, three shotgun shells and fell out and uh, make the dinner. And there's a story in Ebony uh, about Dr. Howard's safari room. He was also known for his fabulous parties, his New Year's Eve parties, both him and his wife, which the black elite often came to. And you get people, I don't have a picture up there, but people like Jesse Owens. I've got a picture of Owens crowning Howard king of the party. Owens, of course, was the famous black athlete who competed in the 1936 Olympics. Uh, he founded the Friendship Medical Center in 1972, the largest privately owned black clinic in the city, which provided a full range of services. There you have the nurses on the opening day dressed in Florence Nightingale uniforms. This is the kind of showmanship that you would see for Dr. Howard. Uh, there are, there, there, those are the employees of the clinic. Howard's daughter is sitting right in front of it. Unfortunately for Howard, he had overextended by this time, um, and he was in bad financial shape, although the clinic was still operating when he died. He died. Uh, there is Howard in his office with his stuffed animals. Um, um, again, very much, uh, you know, this is a signature picture. I wish it was in, I could play it, show the color of one of those. Um, he died in 1976, um, and that is the story of Dr. T.R.M. Howard, I, who I think is, is sort of part of a tradition of local leadership. We often think of people like King, but these are the people that were the main civil rights leaders before King, and they built on a foundation of these businesses and black hospitals. In fact, Mississippi, most civil rights leaders were business people or professionals, not ministers. And so he built a foundation which later flourished. I'll leave it at that since I've already gone, gone my time is up. And do we have time to play some sound clips or should we just open it up for questions? What? It's up to you. Okay, well, um, let me... Play a, well, well, I guess I'll do this. I can't. Oh, we'll do this. The tremendous economic pressure coupled with the constant threat of physical violence that's being applied by the White Census Council of Mississippi 
enjoyed this I think Howard and we've got a movie script too that we're shopping around so if any of you know film producers I think this would make a great movie because Howard was a very colorful fascinating character and he runs counter to the stereotypes we have of who a civil rights leader should be so I'll open it up now thank you very much